that for those of you who are watching from um, the comfort of your home, we welcome you to this session of Making Sense of the Bible. We are on session five today, and uh, it is an interesting session. <clears throat> for those of you who have books and have been reading, you know that uh, it gets right at the heart of why some people want to take a class like this to try to get answers to difficult questions. We're going to be hitting one of those difficult questions today. Um, before we do, I want to draw the group's attention to the goals. I don't usually spend a lot of time on those, but if you'll just know for, for later, those goals give you a really good guidance as to where you might want to go back at some point in time to remind you maybe what we talked about or we didn't talk about it enough and you want to know more. Um, so that's a good list there to go by. But um, before we do that, I do want us to look at the biblical foundation for today's session, and it's written in Jeremiah. Now, talking about difficult topics, Jeremiah knew some stuff, and when he speaks, I like to listen. Unfortunately, his people did not so much. But Jeremiah writes, You will be in the right, O Lord, when I lay charges against you. But let me put my case to you. Why does the way of the guilty prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? I... Interesting. First of all, you think that Jeremiah must have a lot of nerve uh, posing that question to God. And he kind of says right up front, you know, I realize you're, you're God. You're going to be right no matter what. But I don't understand and the reason that it's particularly important, I think, for we so-called postmodern Christians is that we've been led to believe or we've interpreted uh, reading and teachers to be telling us that, especially in this country, I believe, that if we do everything right, we'll talk more about what that means, but if we obey the laws, we step up, take a bath regularly, we obey our parents. We don't break any of the uh, commandments. Uh, we go to church regularly and say our prayers. Then all that happens to us will be good. Isn't that sort of an underlying message? It's almost like a, a threat sometimes. It's like you don't want to misbehave. You don't want to do these things because if you do, then some bad things might happen to you. You won't be able to do it. And that the ultimate bad thing, yes, because if you don't make it to heaven, they tell us clearly what the alternative is, don't they? Yes. And so, even though we've sort of grown up with that in the back of our minds, it didn't take too long. And certainly, because of where we are now in life, we have seen over and over and over again where bad things happen to good people. And yet, for generations, and certainly back in biblical times, there was the idea that if you became ill, or if something devastating happened to you, it was because you had sin. sin. Yes, it was your punishment for having sin. And it kind of made sense if you didn't really know a whole lot about you know, consequences and cause and effect. And so we sort of had a battle between two very clear thoughts that clash 100%. So in the Bible, we read over and over about something terrible happening to a group of people. Sometimes, it's very clear they deserve it, right? Other times, it seems like they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe they just happen to be a part of a country whose king was going to war at the time that was going to cause them a lot of trouble. Some folks said they were just throwing luck in. And then that, yeah, the whole idea of luck, kind of how that fits in, which it's uh, certainly not to, so much uh, about that. But anyway, when we, when we think about God, one of the first things that we're taught is a simple phrase, and it's so wonderful, and I love it, and it's that God is good. <clears throat> Love, thank you, too. Yeah, same idea, yeah. But God is love. Weren't you taught that from your mother or father's knee or, or somebody's knee? Yeah, God is love. And that's so straightforward. Turn it around. Love is God. 
which is the way I like to look at it. I think love is absolutely from God to us. And then we start to read these stories. And even as children, when we read about some of those stories, they come across a little bit more like watching the Westerns on Saturday morning, don't they? The good guys versus the bad guys. That are, and we don't give it a whole lot of thought. But I want you to... You know the good guys are going to win. Yeah, and of course they have on white hats. Yeah. They have them on white hats, too. Right. Because you can tell if they got on white hats, they're the good guys. It was a lot easier then, right? The only problem was sometimes that wasn't accurate, but we don't want to we don't want to mess with it. I'm getting away here. Um, I want you to look at these two. Um, can you see from there, Joshua in the Battle of Jericho? Yes. And Jonah and the big fish. Think for just a minute about just uh, Joshua in the Battle of Jericho. As it comes to your mind, just call out the main things that happened in that. What was that all about? And the walls came to them. <laughs> yes. And he told them to kill everybody. God didn't say that. He did? Somebody did. <laughs> Says that in the Bible, doesn't it? Yeah. In fact, totally. those were his orders to Joshua, weren't they? And, then, and also to kill all the animals. Exactly. Now that's those fighting words for us, aren't they? We start killing the little pup dogs. You know, we get, and so it doesn't fit into the paradigm that we have, does it? Kill everyone. It's saying that God told them, told Joshua to destroy those people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, in, in today's session, we are not going back to when we talked about um, types of literature in the Bible and whether we can analyze one as being accurate history or maybe allegorical. That's not even the point today. The point is, in reading this in the Bible, we hear some heavy, violent behavior. God tells a lot of people to kill it. Exactly. That's, and that's what we're talking about. So in Jericho, we know Joshua was leading the people into the land of Canaan. This is a good thing, right? They're going to go into the land of milk and honey, and they're going to finally get their territory, and then we're going to jump over, and all the tribes will have their land, and everybody will be happy. Well, there's a little gap in there. And one of the main gaps was at the beginning, when first they had to go and conquer every little village, every little whatever, to get into the land. The there were people who wanted to live there, too. Mm-hmm. And it was, and they were there. They and were already there. there. Yeah. And they've been there a while too. I couldn't help thinking about regentrification in the cities, where you have people living in an area of, of poverty, but it's their home and they're making do and everything. And then rich people want to come in and and redo everything and make it lovely, and then they can't afford to live there, and they have to move on. And I'm thinking, well, that's nothing compared to what was happening to Jericho. They didn't get a chance to move on. No. God no. didn't say they could move back. Mm -hmm. If so, they did, where would they go? Right. So, because of our faith, I think we can put on this hat right now and be okay with it. We can put on the hat that says, this sounds questionable for godly behavior, doesn't it? You know how I'm always saying, if it doesn't sound like God, God is love. Well, Get in there and kill know. every man, woman, child, and every animal. If you think about the story, though, See, he says everybody's got to move out that's here. And they're not going to move out by you. And they're going to want revenge. And they're going to want to come back. So you can see why he tells them just go ahead and get rid of all of them start. Man, you don't have to worry about that in the future. So is there any thought? <laughs> yeah. That's something to think about. You know, you're moving somebody out, you're taking their stuff. Well, they're going to be mad as a hornet. They're going to want to come back and get it back. Mm -hmm. So that means you're going to be fighting those folks for years. Yeah, I grew up in the God says, let's get rid of them all on the start. We don't have that problem. Violence does uh, perpetuate more violence, I think. Mm -hmm. I do, I do. Uh, 
I, I don't I don't have a response for that, Tom, but, but I can't argue with you, technically speaking, you're absolutely right. But at the same time, you I don't know. see why they didn't take that position, though. They who? The Israelites coming in. But they didn't take that position until God told them to take that position. Right? But they had it. They were told to take the city. Uh -huh. And they knew there's going to be a big fight. And they'd lose a lot of their citizens. Okay. So you can see why they thought that God told them to do that. Oh, you're going, you're getting ahead of me. Very good. He's saying that the human beings that were inspired by God to write the Old Testament also knew the culture and the way things were done and maybe assumed that God would want them to do this. Yeah, very good. Yeah, you're way ahead of us. But right this moment, we're thinking, this just doesn't feel right. Well, we're in a different culture. In a different exactly. Time. Exactly. But it's still God when it happens. And when you say, <laughs> yeah, when you say it's a different culture, you hit the nail right on the head because it sounds like change. Now, I don't want to go any further with that until we look at the story of Jonah and the big fish. Again, we're not looking at the historicity of it. We're just looking at the story. What are the main points of the story? What happens? Fish <laughs> Well, how did he come to be swallowed? He, he was trying to hide. Trying to hide from God. Because what did God want him to do? He wanted him to go preach. Go preach. And he didn't want to go. Why? Well, he, he didn't think too much of those folks that he was going to preach to. Becky, what were those folks like? They were, um, I don't know. Despicable. They were, yeah, they were. Deplorable. <laughs> yeah. They were sinners. Yeah, they were. They were really, really bad. They were really bad. There's no question about that. Wanted Jonah yeah. to. There's no question about to that. To make go and make a difference with them. Yeah. God wanted them to be turned from this despicable behavior. He wanted them to be saved from themselves, and He wanted His man Jonah to go and preach God's word to them and save them. Okay. Now wait a minute. And he was afraid to go because he said that not going to work. Because he knew they were despicable, didn't he? And he's like, why should I go over and mess with this? People? But if he's thinking, well, I know what God did to in Jericho, so I don't have to worry. I'll go on over there and I'll throw out a few revival meetings and they won't change and I'll smile. He didn't say that, did he? Mm -hmm. Why not? Because he knew what about God? God, I know that you're a man of grace and you're slow to anger and you know what you're going to do. You're going to wait around here and they're going to they're gonna turn from their evil ways and you're going to forgive them and I can't bear that. <laughs> now, why would Jonah think that about God, the God who just wiped out the entire village of Jericho? And it doesn't even say the people in Jericho were very, very bad. They were just in the way. They were just there. They were just there. Here the Ninevites are beyond despicable. And instead of just brushing them off the area and getting rid of them, he goes to all this trouble. He doesn't just argue with Jonah, does he? He doesn't say, Jonah, now I'm serious. Like the kid that won't clean up there. I've told you twice to go to Nineveh. I'm not playing around. You get to Nineveh. He went to a lot of trouble, didn't he? Because Jonah didn't just say, I'd rather not. He, as you said, ran away. Ran away. Yeah. Jumped a freight train. Couldn't he do jumped, that. He probably jumped a camp. <laughs> he jumped something and finally ended up on a ship. You know, back then you'd think you're out in the, in the ocean on a ship. You're pretty safe. Nobody can get to you. Except... God. God. Because yeah. he caused a big old storm. And how do people feel about that? We know how the disciples felt when they were out in the middle of just little old Sea of Galilee and the storm came up. How do you think these guys on the ship with them felt? They figured somebody was bad on the ship. Something was wrong. 
Yep. And like we said earlier, when something's going wrong, somebody must have done something bad. Well, was Jonah one of their buddies? He was sleeping. He wasn't one of their buddies. He just had gotten a ride on the boat. So since he was the outsider, it was logical that he was the one that was bad. He wasn't outsider. He's different. Yeah. And so they didn't preach to him and try to turn him around, did they? They just decided they'd throw him over. So here Jonah was going to die because of his decisions. And in the story, he is swallowed by a whale or a really big fish, fish. And he lives in the fish. Now we just jumped through all that. Bottom line is he survives his ordeal. And he ends up on the beach. And it's like, what does he say then? It has God given up on him? Or is God still saying, I told you. I told you to get your little behind over there and preach to the Ninevites. And then what did Joe say? Okay. Maybe he said, maybe this time. I don't like it, but I'll do it. Yes. Now here, this is God. Just, I mean, look at all the hoops he's jumping through to save the Ninevites. Okay, now, we've gone on too long with this because the point of this exercise is... God of Jericho, God of Nineveh, don't sound like the same God, do they? Mm -hmm. So did God change? And especially as we get to the New Testament, do we see him wiping out villages in the New Testament? We don't. So did God change? Or did human beings change? Well, Adam seems to think some of these Things were written so much after it happened that folks remembered different. So it wasn't so much that man changed, they just remembered different. And we always want to remember that we were acting in alliance with God. We were acting the way God wanted us to. You know, we do want to kind of feel that way, don't we? I did tell that lie. But you know, it was it wasn't a bad lie, and it was really because I wanted to do something to help somebody else. And I know God understands because He's always told me to be loving and kind, so He'd be okay with the lie. Uh, isn't that what we do? Yeah. And some of that may well have been involved. Well, let's let Adam speak for himself. We'll see if we agree with him or not. <laughs> and God's affirmation of war and aggression as expressed in the Old Testament. We're going to consider how we interpret the more confusing images of God through the lens of Jesus as the Word made flesh, as God among us. Also, I'd like to call your attention to the reading around the Gospel accounts of Jesus and invite you to explore together how these first century accounts were written and passed out by the eyewitnesses and early apostles. Now, the topic of God's relationship to violence and vengeance is one of the most disturbing and challenging aspects of the entire Bible. I hope that the reading and the study time will give you new tools for wrestling with these texts. So, let's jump in. Now, the question is usually posed to me, why does God seem so compassionate and gracious, merciful and loving in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, God seems angry and harsh and sometimes unjust and, and, and at points, uh, absolutely horrible. Now, I want to pause here for a second and say that's an overly simplistic ans asking of the question or assessment of the issue because, because there are, let's say, 23,000 verses in the Old Testament. We're talking several hundred of them in the Old Testament that portray God in ways that would uh, cause us to ask that question. 
Over and over again in the Old Testament, we find God portrayed as, as uh, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We find the love of God portrayed over and over again in the Old Testament. So we can't just broad brush and say the Old Testament teaches God one way and the New Testament another. Likewise, in the New Testament, while the dominant picture of God portrayed by Jesus is loving, compassion, merciful, forgiving, we still have some pretty harsh passages, say, when we get to the book of Revelation, and we talk about the Last Judgment. So it's too broad simply to say that. But, but what we can say is that a majority of those verses that we are troubled by when it comes to violence attributed to God are found in the earlier portions of the Hebrew Bible, and a few of them in the prophets. So we're going to hit those head on. And i got to tell you, scholars, theologians, biblical scholars, pastors have wrestled with these issues for 2,000 years. Now, of course, the thing that's hardest to wrap our minds around in many cases it has to do with the picture of war that's put forward in the Old Testament. Now, again, let me remind you, 23,000 verses in the Old Testament, we're talking about several hundred of them. This is not the dominant strand in the Old Testament, but we come to the war passages. This is in Deuteronomy, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and uh, maybe a little bit of Leviticus, I don't remember, but largely in the book of Joshua. Joshua is the story of the conquest of the land of Canaan. So the Israelites have passed through the wilderness for 40 years, and now they're at the edge of the land of Canaan, and they're about to conquer it and take it over. It's the promised land. And so what we find in Joshua is God commanding the uh, Joshua and the Israelites to attack these various cities. Now, it wasn't like there was a country called Canaan. It was a, it was a region called Canaan. And there were the Canaanites. These were various different people, different tribes and, and races. And so you find they were city-states. There was a king over a city. And there might be 500 people or 15,000 people who live in that city-state. Walled cities uh, and then farmland all around it. The people would come inside the walled cities for protection. And the king was their leader. So you find all of these different people here. And God says, I want you, Joshua, to take the children of Israel. We talked about this last week. March around the city of Jericho, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, as far as we know. When you march around the city of Jericho every day, on the seventh day, march seven times, the walls will come tumbling down. That part we tell in Sunday school, vacation Bible school. It's a great story. Then, God says, and then send the troops in, and you are to dedicate the people in Jericho and the animals to me. They are to be a sacrifice to me, and so you are to kill every man, every woman, every child, every donkey, every cow, as a sacrifice to God. The technical term there in Hebrew was herim. Herim is a word that is a, is a whole sacrifice to God. It is something that is given completely over to God. It's destroyed so that God only is spiritually is the one who receives this. And, and that entire town was to be a herim, a ban, a sacrifice dedicated to God, so that the people couldn't take the people of Jericho and make them slaves or wives or, or take their children. They were instead given wholly over to God by destruction. And, and so we find two very different pictures of God presented in the scriptures, even in the Old Testament. So here's this idea of sacrificing human beings to God, and yet in the story of Abraham and Isaac, God says, no, I'm not the kind of God who wants you to sacrifice people. When God takes Isaac to sacrifice him, or Abraham takes Isaac to sacrifice him, God says, no. I, I don't believe in human sacrifice, and yet here we have this idea of sacrificing every man, woman, child, donkeys, and cows to God in these cows. Which is it? Or we find the, the story of Jonah and the whale. You remember, it's a great story. It's in the Old Testament there. And, and Jonah is sent to the town of Nineveh to preach repentance to them. And Jonah doesn't want to go because he hates the Ninevites, because they're horrible, nasty, no good people, right? And so he wants God to kill the Ninevites, and God says, no, Jonah, I need you to go and preach the Ninevites. Remember, Jonah gets on a boat, and he tries to sail as far away from Nineveh as he can, and then the storm comes up, and they throw him overboard, and the whale swallows him, and finally he gets regurgitated up on the dry land when he says, okay, fine, I'll go, I'll go. So he, so he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches repentance, and the people repent, and, Jonah, and Jonah's mad. He's like, I knew you'd do this. I knew you'd forgive these people. And God says, well, but they're people. They're people. They matter to me. Even the cows matter to me. Right? So which is it? Is it God cares about the people, even though they're non-Israelite, even though they're horrible wretches, or God wants all of them killed? And, and so is there another way to look at this? Well, there's probably a lot of other ways, but the, the one way that I'm going to suggest to you is rooted in what I taught you last week, and that is having a more nuanced, or I hate to use this word, but sophisticated understanding of the Scripture. What is the Bible? 
And what we learned last week is the Bible is this amalgamation of both the human reflections upon God and somewhere in there, God breathing through the text in these stories, words that speak to us and grip our hearts. And, 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 it's, and, and when I come to these passages that are difficult that don't line up with the picture of God found in Jesus Christ, then I have to say maybe that reflects more the humanity and the understanding of the people of that time than it does God's self-revelation to us. See, one thing we learned last week was that God came in human flesh in Jesus Christ to truly show us and teach us, this is what I'm like, this is who I am, this is my will for your life. Every other word about God is mitigated through human beings who live in time and space, in historical circumstances, with their own preconceived ideas and presuppositions. But Jesus came and he is the, he is the unmitigated word of God. Some of our friends talk about the entire Bible as the inerrant and infallible word of God. Let me tell you, Jesus is the inerrant and infallible word of God. Jesus is the word by which you judge all other words. Everything else is somehow God breathing through human beings who are fallible human beings. And so when I read these texts, part of what I ask is, is you see this very different picture of God in Joshua than you do in the Gospels. And this is a question many of you asked. Who changed? Did God change from Joshua to the time of Jesus? Or did human beings change in their understanding of God during that period of time? There's an interesting uh, idea that I want to mention here uh, that scholars sometimes talk about. The idea was progressive revelation. So revelation is God revealing himself and what he's like and who he is and his will for our lives. And that this is revealed progressively. So Abraham, God didn't tell Abraham everything there was to know about him. Just some things. And then Moses learns a little bit more. And the prophets learn a little bit more. And then finally comes Jesus, who is the clearest picture of God. And so you find it's not, again... Uh, that God is changing. It is the amount of light that each of those generations have in order to understand. And Jesus becomes the pinnacle of that, the apex of that, the word that's made flesh. Now again, this understanding of the, of the ancient Near Eastern culture is really helpful when we read these passages. In 1868, there was a stone that was found in what's modern-day Jordan. And this stone is uh, known as the Moabite stone. 1868, this was found. It's about three feet tall. And this is how we picture the Ten Commandments, those stone tablets. This was from 840 years before Christ, 840 B.C., which made it the oldest physical piece of evidence of anything that we have that was happening in the Bible. You see, the Bible was written and then copied and recopied, and so the oldest scrolls that we have of the Bible go back to about 100 years before Christ. But suddenly we had the Moabite stone that went back to 840 years before Christ, and interestingly enough, it was written by the king of the Moabites, but he speaks of things that we find recorded in the books of Kings and Chronicles. It's a very important piece of, of ar uh, archaeological evidence towards the veracity of the scripture. However, what you find here is Misha, who is the king of the Moabites, has just conquered the town of Nebo, where the Israelites live. And I want you to hear how Misha understood what he was going to do and what he had done in conquering this town and putting every one of the 7,000 people there to death. So on that, uh, on that, uh, stone, we read these words, and Chemosh, Chemosh was the god of the Moabites, and Chemosh said to me, Misha, go take Nebo from Israel. So I went by night, and I fought against it, that is, he took his soldiers with him, I fought against it from break of dawn until noon. I took it, and I slew all 7,000 men, all 7,000 women, all 7,000 slaves, and free people. For Chemosh, I put it to the van. Now, we don't believe that Chemosh existed. There was no Chemosh. And yet, the urge that he felt to go to battle against the town of Nebo, he attributed to Chemosh, his god, telling him to go wage war. And he decided to put everyone to death as a way of honoring his god and eliminating any possible opponents. This was how people waged war in those times. That's what I'm trying to say is what we find is this is almost word for word what we find in the scriptures describing how Joshua waged war. And so this tells us this was how people understood the waging of war and the relationship of the gods to the waging of war. Here's the last thing I want to say. Is it wasn't just the ancient Israelites who struggled with their cultural norms and then somehow made God fit into those cultural norms. We still do the same thing. Right? Uh, so, so I was thinking about the prosperity gospel preachers. If you flip through Christian TV, you're going to find these TV evangelists who are on there, and they're teaching people that God wants you to be rich. 
God wants you to be prosperous. God wants you to have a five-bedroom home with four and a half baths and a, a three-car garage. God wants you to have all of these things. And of course, the way to get them just conveniently happens to be to send a check to their ministry. And uh, uh, which certainly does help them have the things that they're describing. But, but you know, you listen to this. Now, really? It's like high on God's priority list that you have a six-figure income and a, four, and a three- or four-car garage when there's 30,000 people dying of starvation and malnutrition-related diseases around the world every day. That's really God's priority. It's not that it's a sin that you have something as long as you earn it justly and you're generous with what you have and you're, and you're fair to your employees. It's not that it's a sin. It's just that, is that really God's priority is to make sure you're rich? But see, that form of Christianity is a perfect match for cultural American materialism. And so you find scriptures that fit that and you make God fit into this norm. The Dutch Reformed Church in, in South Africa during apartheid, right? There were some courageous pastors in the Dutch Reformed Church, this was the national church, who preached against apartheid, but a large number of them took the Bible and they found passages that seemed to support the idea that God had predestined some people to be of the servant lower class and some people to be leaders in the upper class. And they justify the mistreatment of Af um, Africans in South Africa, uh, of black Africans in South Africa, using the text because they saw God through the lens of apartheid. You know, for those of you who are Republicans, God looks pretty Republican. For those of you who are Democrats, God looks pretty Democrat. For those of you who are Libertarians, God's definitely a Libertarian. And we take our values, and then we make God mesh into those and fit into those, and, and we really want the God who fits our preconceived ideas. And what I'm inviting all of us to do, myself included, because I have a lot of presuppositions about God that probably aren't God's, aren't really who God is, is to really try to understand the God who's made known in Jesus Christ. And to let that God transform our presuppositions as opposed to making our presuppositions transform our image of God. Which is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right, listen, this is a complicated topic. And what I'm telling you is I've spent hundreds of hours trying to wrestle with this over the last 30 years. I love the Bible, and I see in it God speaking. And it is the book that has shaped my life. And yet there are places where I have to say, this can't be who God is if God is who Jesus says he is. And so I'm trying to teach you it's okay for you to say, I park this, but I still look for the beauty of that. And in the end, I, I define all the words about God in the light of who Jesus is. That's my hope for us as we read the scripture. So, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. My goodness. Sounds like scriptures describing what you all do every time you try to learn more about scripture and how it speaks to you, etc. Alright? And sometimes you wonder why didn't Jesus come to folks in the Old Testament? <laughs> Jesus was there, remember? It's a triune God. In the beginning was the Word. Yeah, Jesus was there. But because he wasn't walking physically on the earth, God would reveal in ways that they could handle with the knowledge they had, the culture they had, but it was a lot a far cry from who God really was. And I can only imagine how how difficult that was. And you think, well, why didn't Jesus just come down like he did in the New Testament? And I have to believe that that human beings weren't ready yet. I don't know. I don't know. I truly don't. They're but not that's, ready now sometimes you think. Exactly, exactly. Oh, uh, when he talked about progressive revelation, that's what I was thinking, is that um, there are things that we do with our children, and not this is a whole topic I don't want to get on a soapbox about. Sometimes parents do things with their children that they're, they're not old enough to do. But anyway, but for the most part, when a baby's in a crib and they cry, you know they're probably hungry. And you don't say, gosh, I'm starving too. And you throw the baby over by steak. Why not? The baby's hungry. That's one of the best things you could give a baby. Well, at least that's what you think would be one of the best things. Baby can't handle that, right? So, you know, not to make it too simplistic, but 
there is some evidence that culturally God was trying to relate to the lives of the people that uh, were there. And if you look at it, as crazy as some of these things seem to us, through the 2,000 years before Jesus and then the 2,000 years since, there has been a lot of transformation. There has been a lot of growth and development. Just not enough. <laughs> um, people get upset when I say this, but overall, the human beings on the planet right now are probably the most peaceful they've ever been. Does that make you crazy when I say that? <laughs> because we know how violent the world still is, right? But it's not every little town going to war against this little town and, you know, the swords and, and the blood running in the streets and all that. So as bad as things are, I do think there's been some development and, and some growth. But anyway, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. He said something I wanted to be sure I lift up on. Um, It's gone. It was from there. Um, I like that. This is it. This is it. I like the part when he was talking about uh, the Moabite stone. I find that fascinating. And not just fascinating, I find it uh, informative because you can't argue with that. You, you can't say it's really not a stone, it's just to make us think of a stone. You know, I've got allegorical stories of this a real stone. And the etchings and the writing and all this right there. And with biblical scholars of language, all of that can be translated. Beyond that, which is fascinating, is the fact that here was a man reacting to what he said was what his God was telling him to do. Now think about this. If that God didn't exist, he couldn't possibly have been telling him those things, could he? Any more than Flip Wilson could have been here, the devil tell him to do it, right? Yeah, but he must have thought or in his mind decided that's what his God wanted him to do. Doesn't that give credence to the idea that these human beings, as they interpreted what God was doing in their lives and what God was saying to their prophets and what they were seeing with these other people, could have misremembered, could have misinterpreted, um, again, based on this was the way they lived. Maybe they wanted to do that anyhow. They said that. Exactly. Exactly. You've got it. I mean, Jonah was pretty much a clear example of that. It was going there and wipe them all out. What did Jonah say after the Ninevites repented and turned to God? That's one of my favorite lines of the whole Bible. Well, just kill me now. <laughs> That's how upset he was. That all those people had been saved. Just kill me now. I don't even want to be alive. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Just terrible. Okay, we must move along. We must move along. Um, It is important for us to be sure and walk away with the whole idea of good causes good things and bad causes bad things. I think it's uh, always been critical. I think it's been critical in our lives for the last 85 years. But during this time of COVID and other times, I mean, you think back to 9-11, the people in the towers, how many of them had done anything that could remotely have made them deserve a consequence like that. Okay, they went in the building. There you go. They went in the building, therefore, this was their consequence. No. We wrestle with these things a lot this day and time. And it really, and this is a soapbox, Chuck says, oh, here she goes. <clears throat> this really bothers me because I have talked to so many people here, wonderful, faithful people, who say, um, that they watch our service in the chapel on TV and they really enjoy it. And then they will say, but I really enjoy watching. And they'll name a couple other pastors and that's all great. And then they'll name a pastor that is absolutely a bona fide prosperity pastor. Now I want to ask you, and I want you to leave with this information. 
if, if, if I say, Becky, you're a prosperity gospel preacher, what am I saying about her? Everything is going to be all right. She's going to preach good things to her. Everything's going to be all right if you listen to me and do and do what I say is right. Yeah. The prosperity gospel says if you do these good things, it will come back to you, and usually it'll be like in tenfold or whatever. Uh, it, I, one of my professors, and uh, I wish I could talk more about her right now, but she, uh, she had she had survived stage four cancer. But anyway. Um, she wrote a, the book called The Prosperity Gospel. But the whole idea is that if we do write, everything will go well. Does that line up with anything we've ever read or observed? Does it line up with the book of Job? Book of Job as a story to learn from or book of Job as a factual accounting? It doesn't line up, does it? No. Have you ever known someone that you knew in your heart was ten times the faithful uh, child of God that you are, and something horrible happened to them? All the time. All yeah. the time. So I just have to caution us to don't ever take your brain off and stick it in the girl. You know, keep saying, does it sound like God? And the great thing about the revelation of God in Jesus is that we have so much black and white information to hold up and say, that's not what Jesus sounded like. That's not the kind of things Jesus said and did. Now, can different political groups, can different denominations, da, 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 can we twist those things around? Of course we can. We have and we do. But we, we can decide that we're going to use our brains, we're going to use our hearts, we're going to use our prayer to God and our scripture to discern if this truly does seem like something God would want us to be or to do or to think. Does that make sense? Well, speaking of Job, <laughs> what's going on with Job? And again, we're not talking today about whether it's a true story. It's a fabulous story, right? So what's going on in Job? He did everything right. That's the main thing. Who says that this is a man who did what he was supposed to do? God said, you can't get a better character witness than that. God said, this is a righteous man. He's followed me. He, but he basically just says he's done nothing wrong in his life. All but perfect. So, do bad things happen to him? Could you say that the worst things that have ever happened to anybody happened to him? Pretty much. Pretty much. Absolutely. So what does that tell us? Goodness didn't give him good things. If bad things happened to him, although he was good. That's right. But now, the first time you might think, hmm. But after a while, didn't Job's friends and his wife and everybody say, come on, man. You've done something wrong. Yes. Why would your God put up with this? Why would God allow these things? I think those are good questions. Unless your faith is so clear that you know that one isn't the result of the other. That if this is not sent by God, God is going to somehow stay with me and get me through it. That's a tough order, though, isn't it, for a mere human being? You know, you begin to think maybe it was sent by God. Yeah. Maybe he's just testing me. That's why we keep working with ourselves to learn what would God likely do and what would God likely not do. And doing cruel cool things to test our faith doesn't sound like God to me. No. Is it possible? Absolutely. But is it probable? Doesn't sound like God. No. So through all of this story of Job, and I mean, we could go on and on about the insane things that happened to him. Uh, and not just the pain, but just isolation and rebuke and da 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 Job never abandons his faith. 
What does his wife say at the end? That's kind of strong yeah. faith, isn't it? It is as strong as it gets. I wonder if that's what God wants us to get out of the story. That that's what we are called to. To have a faith that would get us through the worst nightmare we can, can't even imagine. But as we get toward the end of Job, the Sunday scripture, his wife said to him, you just need to curse God and go ahead and die and get it over with. You can understand that. Sure, you can understand it. But was that what he needed to hear from her? Well, he didn't think so. No, he didn't listen to her, did he? Sometimes we all we all have those moments. Absolutely. That way. I mean, we hear people say all the time, sometimes sort of jokingly, well, I might as well just be dead. You know, I, I can't go on. Just, you know, just like, <laughs> like Joe, Joe said, just kill me now, you know. But he had, he had been all but dead, really, when you look at all that had happened to him. And she's like, just go ahead. Pay God back for what he's done to you. Curse him. And then just lay down and die, and it's all over. That was too easy. Yeah, that was too easy. After he'd gone through all that, all that story, then to lose the fight at the very end by giving up. Yeah, but he didn't. He did not do that. Okay, what else? There's suffering and there's punishment. Do you think we don't like suffering? And we do like to have something to blame, right? You know, if I get up and I go around the edge of the bed and I cram my toe into the corner of the bedpost, <laughs> as soon as I can recover from the pain, I want to blame something, don't I? It was not my fault. It wasn't that I should have turned on the light. What Chuck put that bed there for? It should have been put over there. You know, we like to have a reason for our pain because we don't like to suffer. That happens at least this. five times every day to me because I do not like to wear shoes in my house. <laughs> I think the solution is to wear shoes in my house. Exactly. You know, because you blame somebody else for something else that makes you feel better. But now when we look at something simple like Becky just mentioned and like I mentioned, it's pretty easy to see, well, if you're tired of getting up in the middle of the night and stomping your toe, don't get up in the middle of the night, turn the light on first, Watch where you're walking. You know, aren't we saying that sometimes our suffering is a result of what we do? Yes. Isn't it a lot of times? A lot of times. Yeah. But well, we don't want you didn't turn that light off. That's your fault. Exactly. But you know, we don't want to say that. We don't want to say that. And so culturally, from the beginning, it was well, we know who's in charge of everything, right? And that was a good thought. God's in charge of everything. And so the whole idea of God's providence, if something happens and we don't get it, what's the answer? Well, it's whatever God wanted and you know he's in charge. That's a real good way to answer anything you don't understand. You know, why did that airplane just suddenly fall into the ocean? Don't know. Couldn't have been mechanical trouble. Couldn't have been anything... Must have been just God's will. God plays the yeah. And so I do think we have come a good ways from that. But at the same time, when we lose someone or something that's precious to us, it is very hard to be that logical at the time. Um, we did a whole workshop on things we say that make no sense theologically like God won't give you more than you can handle. Which suggests that God gives you bad things just to see if you can handle them. We don't think about the other side of the expression. We're not going to get into all that today, but if you think about it, if we take this from you trip over the rug because you put the rug there, I don't care anything in the Bible that says you've got to be sure to put a rug there, you know, and on and on. And if we take it all the way out, so much that goes on in our lives is a part of this world that has been the result of disobedience. And not even disobedience, maybe, as decisions we've made that I don't believe I ever heard anyone say that God told. The Wright brothers, 
Don't remember them ever saying that they woke up in the middle of the night and God was saying, build an airplane. I want people to fly all over the world. Now, does God care if we fly all over the world? I don't know. But he didn't ordain through scripture that we create airplanes, right? And if we could go on and on and on. So, so much that happens in our world is just there's an action, and when we learn in school for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And the reaction to my crowning my toe into the post of the bed is suffering. And I'm a really good person, so that means good people suffer, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness, let's see. Um, Little bit without post. <laughs> yes, the, the last part of our time together today we are supposed to look at three chapters, <laughs> no problem, and we were going to divide into groups, but we're going to do it a little bit a different way. Um, take your book, and let's look quickly at chapter 24. If you have your book at home, you may want to do this with us, um, but we're going to be looking at can we trust the gospel accounts of Jesus? So in chapter 24... And I'll give you a page number if I get there. It's about 226, 7, 8, 220, this chapter. 231. 231. <clears throat> Can we trust the gospel accounts of Jesus? And I'm sure you're, you're grasping what that title means, but it's basically saying... In the Gospels, this is what it says about Jesus. Can we trust that what's written there in those Gospels is true? What do you think? We have to accept that somebody wrote it. What kind of somebody? We don't know. <laughs> Were the people that wrote the Gospels close to Jesus? In some cases, some, some cases, no. For the four Gospels, we believe they were. Yeah. Now, not necessarily the people that in the end were typing it on the type. I'm kidding. <laughs> not the ones that actually put it down to paper. But the stories, the preaching, the memories that were shared, this all came directly from the disciples. They were close to Jesus. Had Sometimes any, they didn't hear what he meant. They didn't understand. The other thing was, think back to the last time your brother gave you some advice. I suspect that was a while back. <laughs> and for me, it was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. You think I might misremember it? Yeah. Or I might remember that she said this, and actually she never said that. I read it somewhere in my mind. My mother was so wonderful that oh, she must have said that. You know, Because I'm always saying things that my mother said, but in my mind it's almost like she invented the say. I don't know, she did. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. She didn't make that up. She would just say it. You know? She meant to um, say it. So they might have misremembered. That's very possible. Because they didn't write it down like reporters do now. They follow the president, they follow any celebrity around, and they're writing notes and taking pictures the whole time like that. They're even recording them. That is not the way life with the disciples and Jesus was. And it was at the end of their lives, remember, that all of this started getting put down. Well, what have they been doing from, from the time they were in their 30s until now they're in their 80s or whatever? What have they been doing with their time? Just sitting around waiting to write the Gospels? Or they were working for God. They were out there working for the Lord. Yes, they were teaching and preaching and going throughout the land, teaching them all the things that Jesus had taught them. Isn't that what it says at the end of Matthew? They were doing that, and people were hearing, and people were believing, and their lives were being transformed. But at the same time, it was all word of mouth. So was the message changing during that time with the apostles? I believe that, that it did some. Do you believe that the message could have changed so that it doesn't reflect what God wanted us to know at all? No. 
Yes, it could have. It could have. Is that where the inspired Word of God comes in? They were human. They could only do what they could do. They were using their memories. Did they love Jesus? Yes. Did they believe Jesus was the Messiah? Yes. yes. Would that not color how you would want to tell the story? I mean, what I would teach in my classroom, I would have a lot of kinds of, you're not surprised, crazy examples of things because I wanted them to pay attention and to learn something. Now, I'm not saying the disciples made up crazy stories. I'm saying the passion they had, that they wanted the people to get the message. So, would you be more surprised that the, that the Gospels are not 100% carbon copies of what Jesus said and did? Because they had to tell it so people would understand it. And get that they would understand it? Could, those, could the disciples actually write? Mm-hmm. Could they? Uh, that was not part of their daily lives, no. It would, be, it would have been done by scribes and other folks way later. Yeah. Into the first century, I mean the second there century. There was really no way yeah. they could have written it. The scribes, that's all they did. But when you read the Gospels, is the miracle or, or is, the, is the discrepancy in all the errors and the misquotes, or is it the miracle that the story is so similar? That's the miracle. That's the miracle. Didn't Adam say somewhere in his book, and you probably have heard this other places, Attorneys will tell you that if there's been a, a crime or an accident, witnesses. the witnesses will never, they, they won't tell the same thing. So does that mean they're lying? Are they lying? No. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, no. If they're just normal citizens, they have no reason to lie. So they say, his brown car. They say it was stories that they would have somebody come running in an auditorium or do something crazy, mm-hmm. and then they'd pick out folks out of the audience and say, what did he do? Depends on whether you were paying any attention or what. You know, and I'm amazed at what I missed. Yeah. Most of them didn't agree. Well, I've had that happen uh, often. Yeah. I've never been to court and had to testify. Yeah. But you, um, you remember that you saw something that you didn't see a lot. And sadly, as humans, you don't want to let people down. So when they need information, you want to try to remember. You know. But my point is this: if attorneys know that eyewitnesses, people they know were right there and saw it, can't retell it identically. Those same attorneys say that when they studied the four Gospels, the fact they agree as much as they do it's means it's without question that it had to be true. What's the it had to be true? The message of the Gospel. The older I get, the less I remember about things, you know, that frustrates me sometimes. Yes, yes. Maybe that's a gift from God, <laughs> <laughs> that we don't remember a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> but but seriously, um, as, as, as contemporaries as attorneys are, if they could basically say that, that the agreement of the four Gospels is way beyond anything they would ever hope for with witnesses for their case, uh, that, that says a great thing. So that's a great deal. All right. Um, that doesn't sum up, can we trust the gospel accounts of Jesus? That's a question each one of us has to answer. But I think what we put on the table a little bit is why the specificity of the gospel might vary. But the purpose, the story, the inspired message from God is, in my opinion, quite trustworthy. But that's a question we each have to answer. All right, very quickly. We're going to go to chapter 25. Did Jesus really say that? I'm going to come on. What do you think? If your eye offends you, what should you do? Look it up. Did Jesus really say that? That's crazy talk. Well, maybe he said it. But what did he mean? You know, what was the purpose? No, you didn't hear it like he said it. Yeah. How long would it take for a community to have nobody with eyes? Well, it depends on if they were Ninevites, it might not take any time at all. 
Yeah. So do you think there was a message to what Jesus was saying? If you're looking at things that are tempting you or causing you to think about bad things or leading you to do bad things, you'd be better off to what? Not even have enough. Not even be able to. So does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe well, you could look away. Well, there? Maybe you could look away. Yeah, exactly. Use your eyes for what they were meant to be used for. Right. Um, but you're going to remember, I mean, People that don't remember too awful much about the Bible remember. Well, Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. You know, so we remember. We remember. And I'm like, well, I don't want to pluck my eye out. What's the alternative? Then don't be looking at stuff that's going to lead you in the wrong direction. Okay, what else is here in 25 that you might want to talk about? John 14. Which one? John 14. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. that's the next one. Okay. Jesus did not intend that people pluck out their eyes or cut off their hands. Now, Adam says that very definitively. I try to be cautious about saying what Jesus did or didn't mean. I feel in my heart that he did not mean for us to do that because it makes no sense. No, but it, it's it, it just didn't make any sense. Again, does it sound like Jesus? That he wants us to go around gals and hour? I don't know. Doesn't sound like Jesus. So, what's his message? When he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Well, that means there's not a single rich person ever going to heaven. Is that what he's saying? No, he's saying that money shouldn't mean everything. Riches can be toxic to your soul. Don't let them enslave you. Love what you can do good with money, but don't love the money itself. Also, on a little tangent here that we don't have time for, you may or may not know, but there, there are lots of little entrances into the old city of Jerusalem. And there's one little place with a little bitty door. And uh, humans can go in and out. But whenever they go through with their camels, the camel, they have to take everything off, and the camel has to get down on his belly yeah. and fold his little legs up. If you've ever been on a camel, you know what I mean scared me to death. Anyway, but they get all the way as far as they can, and then they kind of lead them. You know what that little door's called? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. High up the needle. That's what it's called. So he may have been making reference, because that's hard for that camel. And it's hard for riches not to ruin people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it may have been a cultural thing that everybody knew what he was talking about. But it didn't sound like it because the disciples got all bent out of shape, didn't they? Because we're here that years and years later. Yeah. The bottom line is we get the point if we understand that we cannot love money more than our neighbors and more than enough. We have to love. Rule one, rule two. And not let money get in the way. Okay? What else did Jesus say that might shake us up? So love your neighbor. And your yeah. yeah. Love your enemies. I tell this every time I do a Bible study. There's a man at West Market Street. He's probably still going to church there, and I don't think he's forgiven me yet for that. I said that in Sunday school one day, and I'm telling you. What did you say? I didn't hear. That we have to pray for our enemies. Oh. And you would have thought I made it up. I mean, he just went off on me. And I was like, I never that, 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 I fought in World War II, and you can't tell me I'm supposed to pray for those people. I know the horrible things they did. Blah, blah, blah. So, you know, pray for your enemies is a biggie. Yeah. I so, wrestle with that. Pray for the Japanese. Well, but right after Pearl Harbor. Well, we should have been praying for them the way we mistreated them. But anyway, um, <laughs> the ones in this country, but that's another story for another day. Uh, we need to be praying for everybody. If I say God loves a terrorist as much as he loves me, I have a hard time with that. Do you have a hard time with that? Mm -hmm. I have a terrible just don't time. Think about it. So we decide that, well, let's just skip over that. Yeah. And sometimes that might not be a bad thing. As, as the song says, we'll understand it better by and by because we don't get it. Do you really think he loves all of us? Or do you think some of them belong to the devil? I think God loves us all. 
I do think that there are situations where evil has tipped the scale yeah. and consumed the person. Do I think God will ever give up on them? No. no. When Just see, like when you see a terrorist behead somebody, but there, when you see a terrorist stand there and behead somebody, mm -hmm. do you not think perhaps evil is so yeah. into yes. him that maybe God doesn't love him anymore? Exactly. And I also think about the mental illness that comes with some of the horrible things that happen. You don't usually read uh, case histories on tremendously evil people like serial killers and read about a normal life. You just don't. Does that excuse it? No, no. But I do think that God never gives up on us. And I don't understand that, but I'm grateful. Because if I'm not careful, I'm saying, well, gosh, here's that really terrorist. Give up on me, but then he gave up on some of his other folks. Well, yeah, here's this terrorist. Gosh, I'm not doing all that bad. I haven't blown anybody up all day, you know. And so we start saying, ah, oh, no. But does that not get into the battle between good and evil? Say again? Does that not take you into the battle between good and evil? Absolutely. Who's winning in that case? Well, the terrorist who's winning. Well, I, that probably depends on who you are and where mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do in our country, not we, of course, because we're wonderful, but some people in our country will never, ever have any use for a Muslim because in the Quran it talks about killing infidels. We just sat here and talked about our Old Testament, didn't we? You, know, you have to understand a lot more about the situation. A terrorist might be doing it for money. A terrorist might be doing it for pure religious beliefs that have been instilled in them. Right. And the terrorist could be absolutely crazy. They, they just, you know, but the bottom line is evil's winning in that particular case. Evil is definitely winning. What about during World War II, Hitler? I don't think I've read uh, a story of anybody who was quite as evil as he was. Well, and I'd also go further and say, from what I've read, he's pretty messed up, too. He was, yes. He yeah, had yeah, sort of a chicken and egg kind of thing there. Yeah, yeah. No, but, the, but when you think of all of the pain and the, and the suffering that that one person instigated. But again, here's Hitler. Did it all by himself, didn't he? Didn't have any help. Hmm. How far could one man have gotten by himself? Not even to the court. I better stop there before I start getting political. <laughs> well, I know. There's a lot of political <laughs> politics and who was responsible for all that Germany did. Well, sometimes you wonder why did God let all this evil come into the world? Oh. That's a sin. <laughs> That's a test. I don't want to sit that close to you. <laughs> so God let all this evil in the world? That's how I got it? No, but it came from somewhere. It came from Adam and Eve. <laughs> well, in theoretically speaking, it came from Adam and Eve. But God put them here. Is evil a reality? Yeah. Yes. Most most theologians, most scholars, most ordinary folk like us believe that evil is a reality. Yes. And it uh, it is not of God. And what? Where did it come from? I have no idea. That's the dark side. Comes from the dark side, right? But um, everything came from God. Then you think, well, you know, some kind of evil must have come from God too. I, I mean, not not for me, but that doesn't mean I'm right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. God is perfection. But there are all sorts of theories and, and, and brilliant people who talk about um, the whole business of yin and yang, opposites, balance, all way beyond my understanding. But I think there are things there that really provide for the things we need to make a perfect world. And they're all there for a purpose. But how they come about, I don't know. The only thing God has to do with evil is giving us the strength and the direction to fight it. 
That's yeah. also gives us a choice. And it gives and us so a choice. I think during your life, you're drawn between the two. Yes. And you have to choose to go to the positive part and go to God, or you're going to wind up on the negative side of the hymn and in the wrong way. Well, that is sometimes we don't recognize evil when we see it. Oh, such wise words. Absolutely. You know, we pick something up and we think it's a shiny, pretty thing, and it turns out to be a snake. Yeah? We don't always so that good. Pretty. That knows. But you look at your own little children, and you see this all through scripture. On Mother's Day, if your child lives in another state, do you want them to call you and tell you how much they love you and how thankful that they are for you at Mother's Day or Father's Day? And do you want to believe that they really mean it and that it was their idea to call you? Or do you want to find out that your sister called and said, you better call your mama. You see, that's what, that's what Martha's talking about. It doesn't mean anything if it's, if it's just because someone made them do it. It's got to be a, a, a choice. And that's what's so hard about it, is all these things are pulling at us. And no one in the world has ever been able to fight off the evil choices. We know that's not true. true don't don't we? we know that's not true. Oh, we God. wish it were because it would excuse our behavior, wouldn't it? But then we're real fighting evil all the time. All the time. You think we if, can't let up. Do you think if everyone in this community, just white stuff, was constantly looking to the right and trying to avoid and eliminate the bad, that it would get easier for the community? Yes. Mm -hmm. I do. I do. Therefore, it would get easier for the city, get easier for the world. You know, it would get easier. If I ever lose the weight I need to lose and keep there, I won't have to lose all that weight again, right? <laughs> but if I go, oh, Lost that weight. I'll just have me some banana splits, and then there we go. We're our worst enemies, right, Martha? We're our worst enemies. Just one that's not going to hurt. Just one. They get the first one's free, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, we've got one more we need to look at, and this one is huge. And we've got to answer one of the main questions that non-Christians ask all the time, and we have to answer it in nine minutes. Can you go to heaven? If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is your Savior, can you go to heaven? What if you've never heard that? I don't think we can decide who goes to heaven. Ah, oh, awesome. Judge not lest you be judged, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But haven't we heard that all of our lives? Isn't that, what the, isn't that what the dude on the street corner say? Some of us have heard it all our lives, and some people have not heard it at all. So what happens if you're taught you can't judge people? Then. But let's just yeah, let's just look at those who've heard the message. No, 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 And you and you've got the guy down the street who's literally threatening you. If you die tonight, you know where you're going to wake up tomorrow. You know. If you don't repent today, you're going to go to hell. You can't go to heaven. Da, 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 da. He said that in heaven, he said, this Baptist look around and say, who else is here? Now let's not crawl brush the Baptist. <laughs> because there is different, as, there's as many different Baptists as anything else. There but there, there, are certain, <clears throat> there are certain groups of religious folk who have a, a tendency. I call it using the Bible as a weapon. And I'm not a fan of that at all, to threaten people with it. But getting back to the main question, it says, this is what someone in the money group pointed out, it says right on your worksheet there, no one comes to the Father except through me. So if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, I guess you're not going to have eternal life of God. So what do you mean? <gasps> You don't mean that there might be more to those words than me. Oh, there's always more to words. Exactly. Folks, we're reading English after how many translations? Is this what is this the exact words he used in Greek or in Aramaic or were they the Hebrew words he learned as a child? 
What does through me mean? You don't know. And if I tell you what possibilities I think there could be, is that me just twisting it around? We don't know. But do you know anyone, no names need to be called, do you know anyone that in your heart you really believe comes much closer than you do to loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind and loving their neighbors as themselves and do not profess any particular religious belief? I know someone like that. And it's because his parents were almost cultish in their religion and told him when his best friend was dying of brain cancer, that if he prayed hard enough, God would spare his best friend. His best friend died. That's all and time. he rejected his parents' religion and claims not to have an official religion and is the nicest person and is good to other people and lives the most Christian life with somebody who is not a Christian of anybody I've ever met. Which and is that I do not believe that he won't go to heaven. Yeah. Well, but nobody goes to the Father except through me. If you take that literally, well, he goes to heaven. That was because Jesus died for us. He doesn't believe that. He doesn't have to believe that. He took all the sins of the world on the cross. What do you think? We don't. Know. What do you think God looks at at the end of our lives? Our actions, our words, or our hearts. They look at all of it. Definitely look at all of it. But what's the one thing we think that we can get away with? What's in our hearts? Because he knows that nobody else does. I can sit here eating a plate of okra. Oh man, I just love this. This is so good. And God's going, <laughs> because he knows that's a lie. So at the end of the day, whatever that means, it's in my belief that God is going to be judging, and he's the only one who can, us by what's in our hearts. And as the old African-American expression goes, everybody talking about heaven ain't gone. Being in church every Sunday, thumping the Bible and quoting Bible verses and all that does not mean that your heart <laughs> is where it should be. Well, when you get there, he can look and see in your heart whether you deserve it. Now, does that mean that we should say, well, it doesn't really matter if we believe in Jesus or not? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. What we want for everyone is the understanding we have of Jesus Christ because he's the revelation of what God is. And that's what we would want for everyone. But the bottom line is, we should want for ourselves the true belief, the true heart, and not just lip service. Not just go to church for an hour on Sunday and say, you know, I'll go back to selling used cars and cheating people, and I'll go back to drinking and gambling and, and you know, whatever. We make mistakes like that every day that aren't conceded as all that bad. But we do things that are unkind and unthoughtful, unjesus like all the time. A lot of times it's unconsciously. Some of it Even is. people who profess Christianity do the same. We all do those things at times. But we kind of like, well, we've got that Christian label, so that makes us superior. Who gets to decide who is the goat and who is the sheep? Mm. Jesus. God, Father, and Holy Spirit, yes. So. Your hope is a lot more lambs and goats. <laughs> yeah, and the goats and the sheep. But there again, just, this is not meant to be literal, but the point is, we're not in a position to judge other people. You know, the terrorists is killing people, eh, we can have pretty bad feelings about that. But. You know, stop thinking about it, see. If all these folks, it is. Oh, you could go to heaven. Heaven's going to be awful crowded. Well, and if I, God decides by hearts, maybe it's not going to be so crowded after all. Maybe, but how many people do you think God wants in heaven? Everybody. And I, my theory is that He will not stop until He gets us all. Heaven's an awful big place. 
Well, God's an awful big spirit. Heaven is not necessarily what we think it is. I'm 99.9% sure that it is not what we think it is. Well, folks, we've looked at some pretty tough issues today. We, have, we don't have the answers, but we have um, transforming minds because we are trying to get the answers. So next time, you're going to have read and maybe read two or three times chapters 27 through 32. This will finish our book. And then we'll have that class. And then we'll have a seventh class where I want us to, I'm going to try to help us pull some key things together because there's so much that we cover. And I want to make sure that there's some walking away points that we just take with us. Okay? Anything to think about from today's lesson? I hope your mind is swirling. Yeah. Let's have a word prayer. Loving God, we thank you for this opportunity. The audacity that your children could come together and question your word. Question what you mean, question what you want. And we do it, Lord, because we know first and foremost you love us and you want our salvation. You want our lives to be good. You want our lives to make a difference. And therefore, you support us and lead and guide us through our questioning. Lord, we pray for greater discernment. We pray that those who are not here today, Sarah and Ted, we pray that, that uh, neither of them are suffering or sick. And we ask them to go with us. Um, let us keep our eyes on the prize. Let us keep our mind on you and our transformation at times other than Bible study, other than Sunday morning services, to get all that we can to be stronger, to fight off this thing we call evil. This prayer we lift up in your holy name. Amen. Well, I enjoyed being with you, and even though some of what we talked about was not that enjoyable, um, Lots to think about. Think about and pray about. And just you know, you don't want to think about anybody being really evil. No. And I don't believe there are a lot of people that are hundred percent, but I think there are some people that every thought and motive they have is just not good. Anymore.